I'm the department head of archaeology and anthropology, and this year we're celebra celebrating our 50th anniversary as a department in some form of an, uh, or another. And our theme for this year for a series of lectures is archaeology and anthropology in an era of reconciliation and engagement. I think I flipped that around, engagement and reconciliation. Today, our first speaker is our own Professor Jim Waldrum. Um, so he's kicking off our lecture series. And before I turn the floor over to him, I want to just say a few words about Jim and all of his accomplishments. Probably most of you know him, but he actually arrived here at the U of S in 1983 after finishing, <laughs> <laughs> after finishing a PhD at the University of Connecticut. He also was part of the then Department of Native Studies, now Indigenous Studies, as one of the founding members, then moved over to the Department of Psychology, and finally came to us permanently full-time in 2016. So he's been a part of our faculty cohort just now in the third year. For, in his career, he's done extensive research and writing in medical, environmental, and psychological anthropology. And his record includes 17 books, over 16 peer-reviewed articles or chapters in, in edited volumes, a documentary film, over $5 million in research funds, 23 partnerships with Indigenous communities across Canada and in Belize. Um, and he's got a new number of, of uh, acclaims and awards to, to his name. The, in 2005, he won the National Award of Excellence from the Canadian Alliance on Mental Health and Mental Illness. 2009, the Weaver Tremblay Award in Canadian Anthropology, recognizing the excellence of his work. 2013, he was awarded Distinguished Professor here at the University of Saskatchewan. 2014, a Fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. And just last year in 2017, uh, Dr. Waldrum won an impact award from the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada, um, specifically the Impact Award, which is one of, again, one of the big honors from that research council. Anyone who knows Jim knows that as nice as all of these recognitions and productivity are, what matters most to him is knowing that his work has contributed and made a difference to Indigenous communities, the ones that he works with and partners with over the last number of years. He's not only dedicated to this in his profession, but also personally. If you didn't know, Jim is the father of two young Cree women from the Sweetgrass First Nation, and he's the grandfather to four adorable, adorable grandchildren with Indigenous heritage that he celebrates every day. Today, Jim is presenting on his award-winning Shirk-funded research with the Keche Maya Healers of Belize. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to my friend and colleague, Professor Jim Waldrum. Welcome. Well, thank you very much, Angela. That was lovely. Um, I'm not sure who you were talking about there, but... <laughs> Uh, thank you very much. It's actually, it's actually quite nice to just sort of stand there and have somebody read nice things about you. So I, I appreciate it very much. Um, thank you all for coming today. Uh, as we get started, I would like to acknowledge that we are in Treaty 6 territory in the homeland of the Métis. Uh, and this is particularly salient given the, the theme for the uh, anniversary lecture series, series of reconciliation and engagement. Um, as Angela pointed out, there will be a series of five lectures, three involving um, members of our own department who are actively involved in engaged in reconciliation forms of research, and two uh, scholars from uh, other parts of uh, North America. Um, the next one, which I'll, I'll, I'm going to advertise it right now for you, is, uh, is going to be Dr. Rudy Reimer, who's um, an indigenous archaeologist from Simon Fraser University, who's also a TV star. He's the host of uh, uh, APTN's TV show, Wild Archaeology. Uh, and he is going to be here offering a lecture uh, at this time on October 18th. So I'm hoping that you'll be able to make it and you'll... Uh, You'll stay tuned for the announcements that uh, will come out regarding that as well. So um, thank you all for being here. Um, and I think that uh, 
Uh, we'll sort of just jump in here, and my presentation is a bit of a mix of, of <coughs> notes and PowerPoint and so on, and we'll see where this gets us. So, I've called this an imperative to cure, engaging indigenous medicine through collaborative ethnographic research with Ketchi Maya healers and beliefs. I put uh, medicine in quotation marks because that'll ultimately be one of the key issues I'm going to uh, raise here today. So, now as Senator Murray Sinclair has often noted, reconciliation is fundamentally a recognition of and commitment to correcting the wrongs of the past. While academic disciplines themselves are not typically thought of as wrongdoers within the broad history of indigenous settler relations, the fact is that our discipline of archaeology and anthropology was the first one to take the study of indigenous people's culture and history seriously by working in indigenous communities rather than being content to study trader and missionary journals in the archives. There's no question that some of our disciplinary ancestors engaged in some practices that are problematically viewed today within the context of emerging ethical sensibilities. As a step toward reconciliation, not just here in Canada, but internationally as well, it is important for academic disciplines and their practitioners to acknowledge the mistakes of the past and how the ways in which they studied and represented indigenous peoples may have contributed to broader colonial ambitions and sown the seeds for many of the problematic attitudes and other issues that uh, many settlers still hold today, today with respect to indigenous peoples. The subject today of indigenous therapeutics is one such area in which early research grounded in these biases of the time created misleading, and, uh, misleading understandings that continue um, to haunt us to this day. Since its inception, my field of medical anthropology has grappled with how to characterize the therapeutic approaches of non-Western peoples. The field has waffled between questions of religion, belief, and symbolism on one hand, and empiricism, knowledge, and materialism on the other. Between immateriality and materiality, between irrationality and rationality. Over time in the 20th century, there was both a discursive and ethnographic shift in anthropological scholarship in which what was once thought of as indigenous medicine becomes referred to as indigenous healing. Although I cannot provide a precise date, the idea of indigenous medicine simply starts to disappear. This is not just a change in terminology or a refinement to these two concepts. Rather, there is a deeper meaning to the shift, one that springs from several influences, including critical anthropological engagement with bioscience and biomedicine and the symbolic and interpretive turns in which the focus moves from ethnographic description to interpretive meaning in ethnographic studies. These influences in the discipline subtly change the nature of indigenous therapeutic practice as represented in scholarship. Much of the early research on indigenous therapeutics was undertaken by what I would call as hybrid scholars. Often medical doctors, surprisingly, um, <coughs> frequently psychiatrists, also sometimes psychologists, with some training or a passing interest at the very least in, in anthropological issues. As a result, much of this early work focused on indigenous therapeutics that appeared to parallel Western psychology and psychiatry rather than medicine. The notion that indigenous therapeutics heals in the psychosocial sense, emerges at this time in an awkward tension with the idea that it also cures disease and disorder. But as more trained anthropologists took up the study, the emphasis shifts towards the symbolic and the ritual aspects of therapeutics. While earlier commentators raised the issue of therapeutic efficacy, asking, does it work? The later anthropologists were reluctant to address this issue, afraid to address this issue, and instead focused on cultural description and interpretation. <clears throat> Symbolic anthropologist Daniel Mormon summed up this approach when he wrote, and this is a quote, it seems equally clear that neither native practitioners nor their patients saw drugs 
as more vital and self-sustaining portion of the healing process than song and dance. That's a terrible quote and a good quote for a variety of reasons. As the field of medical anthropology continued to develop, indigenous therapeutics took on an additional meaning. As the utopian counterpoint to the ills of Western biomedicine, critical and critical interpretive anthropologists such as Mary S Merrill Singer, Nancy Shepherd Hughes, and Margaret Locke painted simplistic portraits of indigenous therapeutics as holistic, non-dualist, and patient-centered, constructing a harmonious indigenous therapeutics to hammer away at the apparently impersonal and reductionist core of biomedicine. What was not addressed, however, was the extent to which indigenous therapeutics involved detailed knowledge of the body, knowledge of disease and disorder, and effective therapeutic interventions. The result is that today, what is often seen as legitimate indigenous therapeutics involves an emphasis on its transformational potential. And I'll come back to that a little bit later in the, in the presentation. <coughs> This, in turn, marginalizes it as inherently symbolic and psychosocial in orientation and sidesteps questions of the nature of indigenous medical empiricism. This shift renders indigenous therapeutics as more acceptable to the dominant biomedical system, since when defined as healing, it is not a direct challenge. And I would add, also falls outside the boundaries of current legal practice and legal definition. This shift renders indigenous therapeutics as, as um, sorry, um, but this acceptance encourages the restriction of indigenous therapeutics to the delivery of culture-based psychotherapeutic programming in, intended for culturally distinct indigenous populations, and especially in areas underserved by um, uh, state-sanctioned biomedical systems. In this presentation today, I ask, what happens if we engage with the idea of indigenous medicine instead of healing? So some 15 years or so ago, I was contacted by the coordinator for a new association of Kechi Maya medical practitioners in uh, southern Belize about the possibility of undertaking uh, research on their uh, knowledge and their practices. And so the, very quickly, the area I'm working in is this region down here near the Guatemala border, it extends from the community of Punta Gorda out to the border and up just, uh, just south of the, the Big Creek area. So this is the region that I've been working in for 15 years now, so, okay. Um, the group I've been working with is, uh, is uh, formed their own association called the Maya Healers Association. The term, the catchy term that they use are, uh, for themselves is Ilanel. That would roughly translate as a seer uh, and they mean that in the diagnostic sense uh, rather than, um, you know, somebody who sees patients, okay? Um, it's an odd term um, to translate, as is often the case when we look at um, indigenous to English translations, so, okay. So as a result of this contact, we had meetings, meetings, many meetings, many discussions, and we talked about the hopes and the aspirations that the practitioners held it for research how research might be undertaken, and what ultimately was the point. The latter was particularly telling, as the catchy practitioners here had two audiences in mind for research. First, they wished to make knowledge of their practice available to their own people, who were being heavily missionized by evangelical groups from the United States. These churches were taking over much of the educational system in southern Belize, indoctrinating villagers and dividing families along religious lines. Young people were hearing that indigenous bush doctors were charlatans, frauds, or worse, Satan's helpers. But they were also learning about Western knowledge in their schools, especially science that characterized catchy knowledge as primitive. The practitioners needed a vehicle to counteract these influences and firmly believed that scientific research into their practices would confirm what they knew to be true. Their knowledge was deep and empirical and their medical practices were effective. 
So we ultimately decided upon two clear goals for our collaborative work. First, to communicate or to document catchy medical knowledge and practice and to communicate that knowledge to the catchy people, to Belizeans as a whole and the world beyond. Research like this intended for multiple audiences is not uncommon in anthropology today. To communicate to non-specialists, other catchy people, educators, and so on, we have, to date, produced several translation products, including a small book done in both catchy and in English, and a documentary film with catchy narration and dialogue and English subtitles. Both of these products have been distributed in large numbers free to, uh, to the people of Belize and especially the people in the southern villages of Belize where the, the Ketchi Maya are most numerous. Okay. Um, they've also been made available on things like uh, YouTube and Vimeo and, and other kinds of sites and whatnot. So these products are, are freely available as was the, uh, the wishes of the practitioners themselves. But the practitioners also wish, wish to make their knowledge accessible to the medical and scientific community and the health policymakers in their own country as a means to entrench their practices in developing national health policy. They sought scientific validation of their knowledge and practices. And they were confident that such validation would be forthcoming. Simply put, they told me that their therapeutic practice was medical and that it paralleled and complemented biomedicine. To this end, we've produced a variety of scholarly products, such as journal articles and conference presentations. And I'm in the process of completing a monograph on catchy medicine. These materials have been returned to the policymakers in Belize through a variety of their uh, uh, governmental institutions, including the National Institute of Culture and History, among others. My lecture today furthers the goals of the catchy medical practitioners who wish their knowledge to be known across the world. Hence, my collaborative work with the Ketchi represents a form of what is known as doubly engaged ethnography. That is, an ethnographic approach that seeks to both assist the local community as well as advance knowledge more broadly through ethically and methodologically sound scholarship. The practitioners with whom I worked advocated for just this approach long before I encountered the term of doubly engaged ethnography. Now, studying catchy medical knowledge does present some unique issues. Beginning with the nature of catchy medical knowledge itself. To begin with, we have to appreciate there are no medical textbooks, and there's no medical schools, okay? Um, there, uh, each, each, traditional practitioner is trained as an individual by a master. So this apprenticeship model um, means that ultimately their practice is, is isolated. It's a solo practice. Um, so what we're talking about here is that there is no um, sanctioned form of medical knowledge outside of the normal bounds of cultural process. Um, there are no uh, opportunities or reason for healers to come together to share knowledge, to ensure um, conformity to uh, best practices, if you want to use that term. Uh, everybody is operating and doing their medical practice largely in isolation to everybody else. There's no continuing medical education credits, for instance, okay? Um, and when we look at the nature of the medical knowledge, one thing that I learned very quickly was using an oral tradition framework is inadequate. Okay, an oral tradition framework uh, highlights the manner in which knowledge is transmitted. It is not particularly uh, successful in helping us understand how new knowledge is generated. And this is what brings me to the idea of um, catchy empiricism. So working with this notion, I, um, I started to, to work with a couple of concepts that I'll, I'll touch base with here uh, with you here a little bit and then I'll move on um, and come back to them in a little bit. But I talk about the idea of latent empiricism. So this is the sum of all catchy medical knowledge potentially accessible to a practitioner. There's no way to capture that knowledge. That's not possible. Okay. 
Um, even if you brought all catchy medical practitioners together, that still does not really capture what we're talking about here. But it is knowledge that is out there in the community. Okay, it is potentially accessible. Each catchy practitioner learns really just a small portion of that through their apprenticeships. Okay, um, but it does exist. So it's this large body of knowledge that exists, and. I employ the concept of manifest empiricism to, to look at the process by which um, knowledge emanating from that latent empirical, empirical tradition is um, actualized in the application to specific cases. So when a traditional practitioner comes in to meet with them, uh, uh, or a, a, a patient comes in to meet with a practitioner, the practitioner uh, basically takes from that huge body of empirical knowledge a particular element of knowledge that they're most familiar and experienced with, and they apply that to the particular case. So this is what we're calling manifest empiricism. So obviously, I'm making the case that catchy medical knowledge is fundamentally empirical. Um, you might even think of the, the expression of phrenesis. Okay, this is practical wisdom. Okay, it's knowledge come, that comes from the actual practice of medicine, starting as an apprentice and following through their career as they continue to practice and learn and practice and learn and practice and learn. Right. Now, if there's no textbooks, no canons, how do we basically try to understand what this medical knowledge looks like? Okay. How do we research it? Uh, well, so just very briefly, I'll touch on, on some of the obvious ones. Uh, of course, we interview the practitioners. And this is uh, on, uh, on your right is a healer, Manuel Chalk. And he's, uh, he's working with uh, one of our cultural interpreters, um, Federico Cal. Um, you see the, the classic anthropology notebook on his lap. But you'll also see a little, little recorder sitting in the front here, where we're recording the interview, sitting on my U of S Huskies ball cap. Okay. Um, so yeah, so we start by interviewing them. Um, and in order to do that, it's absolutely crucial that um, we work with um, local interpreters and cultural experts. Now, um, not having the luxury of doing my doctorate research again, where I could spend a year and a half learning the language, I focused my, uh, my own uh, linguistic uh, tasks on learning uh, the medical language that the practitioners employ. So the medical procedures, the disorders, uh, anatomy, this kind of thing, uh, and work with the local uh, interpreters uh, to get the, the broader nuances of the language. Fortunately, as part of the team that we've generated, these cultural interpreters are highly knowledgeable individuals about traditional medicine. Uh, and, uh, and frequently, they have a, a close family relative who is one of the practitioners of traditional catchy medicine in southern Belize. So um, they are not just interpreters, but they are um, uh, participants in the full sense of the word, working with the, uh, with the practitioners and with me so that we can have some kind of a meaningful conversation and really get to the nuances of the different kinds of medical conditions and disorders. So these individuals have an extensive background not only in um, traditional healing but in language interpretation uh, and, uh, and some of the more pragmatic things such as um, spelling. Okay, because Ketchi, like other indigenous languages, is, was primarily an oral language. Um, coming up with proper spellings is actually a bit of a chore, and there's several different, different systems in, in play and whatnot. Um, there's a local regional variation, which is not the same as the official Guatemalan version and whatnot. So they were very helpful in making sure that we, we got um, the, the language right that was relevant to the particular region we we're working in. Okay. Um, so, we also video record a lot of interviews. Uh, and this has really become an important thing for the, the catchy people. Um, we've done hundreds of interviews with these uh, healers over the years, many of them video recorded. And 
and it's created a, a fairly large archive of video um, of the practitioners talking about their lives and their work and sharing their knowledge and whatnot. This is 92-year-old Albino McKean, uh, and you can see I'm interviewing him with my little Sony uh, uh, Handycam there, uh, which is one of the first pieces of technology I, I took down with me. Um, so this, is a, this huge archive has proven to be beneficial already, and there's many students in, in, uh, in one of the few public schools uh, in southern Belize, as well as the University of Belize, are beginning to work with these raw um, video uh, um, recordings um, of, the, of the healers. So we've been able to really produce a nice archive for them. Okay. We also record treatment sessions and practitioner interviews. Um, and so what we do there is using uh, our small uh, recording equipment is we will record uh, an actual treatment um, and then um, subsequent, as you see in the top picture, uh, we'll sit down uh, with the laptop and we'll replay the video. And the healer, Mr. Francisco, is in the middle of the top picture, will explain what's going on. Uh, and I'll be able to ask him questions when things are unclear and whatnot, and he'll take me through step by step by step. Obviously, during the actual treatments themselves, uh, we, we can't interrupt and say, what are you doing and whatnot. It's all happening uh, in a way that no, no, no one, including the patients for the most part, understand what's going on. Uh, so the tr we try to be as, as uh, um, uh, less visible as possible. But here we can actually find out the step by step, why this and not that. Uh, approach to uh, treatment. You know, why, why do you think it's this and not that? Why did you use this plant and not that plant as medicine and so on as we work through it as well, okay? And because I'm an anthropologist, of course, we, uh, we um, do participant observation uh, and that's me, you know, you get sick a lot in places like southern Belize uh, and so that's me being treated by Mr. Francisco for uh, probably some kind of gastrointestinal thing which is, is pretty common. So um, the other thing we did to really establish the empirical nature of the uh, catchy medical system are case studies and this is where we were able to follow uh, treatment progress. Uh, from uh, initial contact between a patient and a practitioner through the whole treatment process, through any kind of follow-up, through visits later to find out the, the state of the particular medical condition. So uh, we've generated quite a few of these case studies as well. This allowed us, among other things, to really get a hint at the empiricism that's involved when, uh, when treatments aren't working the way the healer expected they would, how they would react, what, how they would begin to change up um, the kinds of medicines and other procedures they used, or perhaps at what point they would begin to uh, rethink their diagnosis and shift directions and whatnot. So we're able to really see how they sort of um, built that empiricism through the actual practice of uh, uh, treating patients. So now I've made it seem in the title that I'm talking about medicine, and so that's a that's a key question that comes up, and it's one that's very central to the sort of the main issues that I want to get at today and that uh, are particularly relevant to the catchy healers themselves, okay? So is this medicine, all right? It's actually not easy to find a good definition of medicine, um, but I'm approaching it from the point of view of um, a therapeutic system that approaches on, uh, that, that focuses on physiological disorders and that seeks out distinct causes for distinct disorders, okay? Um, and this is precisely the way the catchy practitioners think about it as well. They're gonna show you some of these disorders shortly, okay? Now, these healers, the Ilanel, okay, are very outcome driven. They're very focused on the end point, okay? Um, they're, not a, they're not so much process driven as they are outcome driven. Uh, and this is one of the reasons why the idea of medicine starts to make sense because they're really starting to focus their, their attention on the concept of cure, okay? And this proves to be central to their medical epistemology, right? Um, and so when I look at what, how, we, how we can look at therapeutic processes in general, okay, and this is where I'm going to begin to diverge with some of the existing thinking, okay? Um, I think that we can take any kind of therapeutic process and divide it into two kinds in general. Um, 
from the point of view of an outcome, those that have transformative outcomes and those that have restorative outcomes. So if you just bear with me for a second, okay. In transformative outcomes, it's fundamentally about changing the patient. In other words, the patient at the end of treatment is different from the patient at the beginning of treatment, okay. Uh, and in that sense, then, cure is not considered a likely outcome of the process. It's a long-term process. In some uh, healing traditions, it's a lifelong process, right? In other words, uh, since a person is never fully cured, a person is constantly engaged in this transformational process, right? This, I would suggest, is what largely what is meant today by uh, the concept of healing as it's being uh, employed not only in scholarship but in the popular and professional health sectors. Okay? I'm looking at catchy medicine from the perspective of restorative processes. This is about restoring the patient. This is about, as much as possible, returning the patient to the pre-sickness state. Okay? So in that sense, then, cure is the logical outcome of what they're attempting to do. In other words, a complete removal or reversal of the condition. Okay? That's, that's good in, in the sense that it gives us a very clear marker of what effectiveness should look like. They had it. Now it's gone. Okay. Uh, those of you who study uh, healing processes will, will know the, how difficult it is to come up with some kind of measure for um, uh, success because it is an ongoing process and without a logical endpoint. Uh, in restorative treatment, uh, there is a logical endpoint and it is visible, it is measurable, usually within the, the context of the local knowledge tradition itself. Okay. So, it also means this is somewhat of a short-term process. Okay? Treatment may not last that long. In a lot of transformational processes, uh, a relationship is established between the patient or the client and the practitioner or the healer. And that relationship can go on for a very, very, very long time. You might even think that, in a sense, the practitioner creates a kind of dependency in the patient. Okay? by suggesting that you'll never ever be fully cured, therefore you must continue to do these things, and I'm of course your guide, your guide, I'm your person that's gonna help you continue to do these things. With the restorative traditions, uh, it's relatively short term, and at the end of it, the relationship is severed. There's no more relationship between the practitioner and the patient, okay? And this is what I'm referring to as medicine in this research. Now let me give you a little bit more elaboration about what actually happens in a treatment. Believe me, when I first started doing this work, I did not expect to find these things. And it took me a while to get my head around the fact that this was very, very different than the forms of therapeutics that I had been studying in the past. So when we look at the clinical experience, Mr. Emilio here, the healer, he's wearing a Huskies t-shirt, by the way. You'll see that. Um, when we look at it, it's actually relatively brief, okay? Six to seven minutes is the average length of every treatment session that I've documented, right? Uh, if you look at um, the medical science, uh, they'll suggest that, uh, you know, the, amount of, the average amount of time that uh, a patient spends with a family physician is double that, at least. Okay, so um, thinking back to what I said at the outset about how tra traditional indigenous medicine was being kind of set up as sort of a straw system, a, an artificial system to, 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 to contrast with biomedicine, one of the things that I always said in, in that literature was that these traditional systems, they, were, they got this kind of warm fuzzy about they wanted to get to know you and spend a lot of time with you and all this kind of stuff. What we're finding here is that simply isn't the case. There's very little dialogue between the, the practitioner and the patient. They hardly talk at all. The practitioner rarely asks for anything approaching a case history. Um, the patient may not even be known to the practitioner. Um, the practitioner may not necessarily e even inquire about the patient's name. Okay. And 
stands to reason that the patient doesn't have to be catchy. The patient does not need to know or to understand the symbolic aspects of catchy culture or catchy therapeutics. All right? So if this, if this is fundamentally effective because it's a form of symbolic healing, we have to be able to explain how patients who know nothing of the symbolic system can be effectively treated. So when I started to understand how this was unfolding, like I said, this sort of threw me for a bit of a loop because I was fully indoctrinated in, the, in the, the field of symbolic anthropology and symbolic healing, and I'd written extensively on it in other contexts. I still think that writing was okay, uh, but this was a different context. And so I was quite taken by surprise. So digging in to this further, okay, inquiring about the nature of the medical conditions that the catchy healers themselves um, understand, what I learned was that, in fact, they recognize very discrete diseases and disorders. Today, much indigenous healing is very general in the sense that uh, it's not an attempt to identify a specific disorder and treat it in a specific way, but rather the therapeutic approaches are quite broad uh, and designed to address, as much as anything, the psychosocial issues uh, that the patient is experiencing. Here, no, they recognize very dis discrete diseases and disorders. Um, this is interesting. A lot of people have pushed back on this. Um, they're not uh, necessarily holistic thinkers when it comes to their therapeutics. Okay? They, they actually recognize that disease and disorder can affect the body and the mind as separate ent entities. They're dualists in their thinking. Okay? The, the, Conventional literature would suggest that that's a characteristic of biomedicine, but not of traditional therapeutic systems. Um, but they're also aware of the interrelationship between mind and body. So it's actually quite a, quite a sophisticated understanding that they have developed. Okay? Here's another interesting thing that we've learned. They medicalize psychosocial distress. Again, this is often something that is a knock against biomedicine. That it'll take something like, uh, um, like many of the mental health uh, issues um, and create medical disorders around them. And if you look at the DSM as an example, um, what I learned here is that the, when there are psychosocial issues, the catchy healers treat them as medical disorders. So a patient having difficulty, depressed because, say, his or her spouse has left him or her, um, will not receive talk therapy. They won't be receive counseling of any kind. Uh, they will, in fact, be treated as if they had a physiological disorder. They will be given plant medicines, among other things. Uh, so. Um, if two people are having trouble in their marriage and they go to see a traditional practitioner, there's no marriage counseling. No, it's treated as if it's a, a medical disorder. So um, that whole realm of the psychosocial is medicalized by the catchy healers. So to reiterate where we are at this point, the catchy Practitioners have explained to me, in effect, that they have an imperative to cure. That is their job, to cure patients. That's the therapeutic goal, and they're quite willing to say, measure it. Go ahead and see. Okay, we can do this. Um, the patients are fine. They're restored to their pre-sickness state. Okay? Uh, and of course, this is very different than much of the work that's been done on indigenous healing. So this is where we come into some of our newer questions. Okay. And at this point in the presentation, I'm going to shift a little bit okay, to address how we are dealing with the fact that there are many skeptics, uh, including members of the Belize Medical Establishment, who do not think that this is anything more than bush medicine. In other words, um, uh, superstition based forms of witchcraft and whatnot. So uh, some of the key questions that we have to address 
in talking back to the medical system, is this, is this an empirical system? Is it systematic and structured, or is it esoteric and random? As I said at the outset, the way I characterize uh, the catchy uh, knowledge, one could easily think, well, it must be esoteric and random since they never get together and talk about it. Um, so is there actually a system in this place, in this, in this knowledge? Is there a medical system here? What I'm going to do now is I'm really going to focus on the last two questions um, and, and give you a little, bit of, a little bit of data to kind of mull over a little bit um, and show you how we went about answering these questions. Okay. The, um, the technique we used to get at it is a classic technique of cognitive research, cognitive anthropology, called a pile sort. This is a particularly valuable technique when um, you are dealing with a knowledge system that is not codified or written down in any way. There's a mental map in people's minds. How do we access that mental map? Okay. There's a system in their minds. They're never asked to explain it as a system. They didn't learn it as a system, but if there is a system there, it's in their minds. How do we as researchers get at it? Okay? We can't just say, tell, tell us your medical system. They, would, they wouldn't know where to begin. They wouldn't know what that means. Okay? So we engage with pile sorts. Okay? So this particular exercise was done with uh, five catchy medical practitioners. And you can see Mr. Mr. Manuel Chalk and one of the interpret interpreters, Ray Analeo working on the pile sort. Okay. There are 16 medical conditions we're working with, and the names of the conditions are on each of the cards, both in English and in Ketchy. Um, interestingly, most of the healers can't read. Okay. Um, so the, the, the writing on the cards uh, was sort of a, a kind of a, a mnemonic for the practitioners doing the exercise. Um, who have, they've got amazing memories and could remember what is on each of these cards because we say, okay, this is eta tihel, okay, and whatnot. Uh, and then, you know, as we're building our, our piles and moving through the exercise, we're constantly reconfirming that what they think is the card is, in fact, the card and whatnot and making necessary adjustments and whatnot. And so we say to them, okay, 16 conditions. What we want to do is to create piles, okay? And we're going to give you some criteria by which to create your piles. The first criteria we say is just sort them by similarity. Put together the sicknesses that are similar. Right? We didn't define what that meant, what similarity would mean to them. That comes out later in the research. Ultimately, here are some of the area, ways in which we, were asked, we asked them to do this. Sort them by similarity, by cause, by treatment, and by seriousness. Okay. There were several other sorts as well as we worked through the process. Okay. Because there is going to be a test, these are the 16 conditions. Okay. So we'll come back to them as well, but uh, um, when, I'm, uh, when I'm talking about this in Belize, they're very interested in knowing the, the specific conditions that we're, we're working with. Um, but you can see the, the, the catchy uh, name for the, the condition and then sort of the best English approximation of what it might be, okay? So how do we do it? For all you methodological uh, types out there, um, I used a couple of programs, software programs, Anthropac and UC INET. Um, we, we did multidimensional scaling, which gives you a visual representation of the proximities of the 16 conditions. You'll see that in a second, okay? Uh, and the second thing we do is a hierarchical cluster analysis, which uh, allows us to understand the extent to which items group together, and you'll see that as well. So what these two uh, um, methodological uh, uh, tests are going to do is help take all of those piles that the practitioners had made and map them out in space so we can see what is most likely to have been lumped together. Okay? Having achieved that, then we can say why. We can ask them why. Why did you put these things together? Okay. Okay, so this is an example of a multi-dimensional scale for the, the question of sickness similarity. Okay? So the key thing is not so much the words 
but the dots, okay? The dots are where they plotted out on the scale. What I have done is very crudely drawn around some of the groupings that ultimately emerge from the research. So you can see that there are some things that seem to be in proximities with other things, okay? And this is what the uh, multidimensional scale uh, analytical procedure is going to tell us, is what is grouping together with what? Okay. Now, you can't just stop there. You have to, there's lots of different kinds of analyses you, you ultimately have to do oops, in order to get to the conclusion. But this is an example of a hierarchical cluster analysis for sickness similarity, okay? The key thing to focus on here to understand how this works is that the analytical technique groups things together uh, according to frequency and allows us to see, in a sense, to what extent pairings and groupings are robust. And the first groupings that happen are these three right here. So conditions one and two, three and nine, four and seven, almost always are being grouped together by the, uh, the practitioners, okay? So this is telling us the, sort of the beginnings of a structure to their knowledge. And as we move through it, when we get to the next level, and then to the third level, we see how sicknesses are being grouped together at higher levels of abstraction by the healers. So in this case, 4 and 7, 13 and 16, you've got Eta Yehel and Rilom Sul, which paired together almost immediately, suggesting strong similarities, okay. But a little bit further in the analysis, they group with Shehel Maus and Mausat by the third level, okay. And you can see this emerging, okay. So this is sort of a visual representation of an emerging cognitive structure. I'll give you one more. I spent so much time doing these things, I have to inflict this on you too, okay? <laughs> all right, so what I've done here is I've taken all the data for three of the pile sorts, for cause, treatment, and for general similarities. And I've put them all together, ran the analysis, and what emerges, and again, my crude drawing around it so you can see it, is three distinct groupings of sicknesses followed by, I guess, what you might think of as these outliers, okay? What are they? Well, these red conditions right here are mental, psychological, and emotional disorders. They all have some kind of um, uh, behavioral symptomology to them, okay? Um, the blue, these are spiritual disorders, okay? Um, but they, the disorders originate in the environment. In other words, they are external to the individual, but um, have this sort of interpersonal dimension in the sense that, that um, something in the environment is attacking or contacting or interfering with the individual. So uh, I refer to these as interpersonal spiritual disorders. These are personal spiritual disorders. Um, and uh, some of you from the medical anthropology background will, will, uh, will appreciate that, among other things, this is susto, okay? So um, these are personal spiritual disorders in the sense that it involves some kind of disruption in the individual spiritual system internally. In this case, the spirit exiting the body, okay? So you can see the three groups that emerged here, and you can see some, some of these outliers. When we selected the 16 conditions, we didn't know what, if anything, might group together. Uh, so, um, you know, uh, I'm not, it's not a surprise that there are these extra um, conditions that are kind of hanging out there. And we'll come back, ah, wrong thing, we'll come back to that in a second. Okay. So, looking, given sort of the overview of the, all of the analyses and whatnot, here is a nosological structure, catchy medical knowledge. Category one is disordered psychological and emotional states. Category two is disordered mental states. Category three is disordered interpersonal spiritual states. Category four is disordered spiritual states. These four categories were the most robust in our analysis, okay? There were multiple conditions in each one. They were the clearest ones articulated, okay? But then there's also Category five, disordered physiological states vector-related. Here we'd find things like malaria. 
okay? Uh, disordered physiological states internal, uh, things like ulcers, okay? Uh, and disordered environmental states. Uh, and this, the, there was one sickness in this one uh, called chalk, and it's caused by um, uh, entering um, misty, particular misty, cold air conditions, often early in the morning, uh, in which there is some sort of malevolent spiritual uh, uh, embodiment in, in that mist and whatnot. So, so that's the structure. Now, I would hesitate to say, actually, it's not the structure. It's a structure. It's a structure that emerges from the interaction of me as a researcher, these five catchy practitioners, the sicknesses we chose, and the methods that we utilized. Okay, so um, I would argue that you probably can't ever come up with the structure because it's such a dynamic knowledge tradition. But there is a structure. And you can see it, and you can, the robustness of categories one through four is particularly telling. Okay. So there is a structure, it is systematic. Um, I'm not going to show you any of the day about healer consensus, but we also ran a variety of procedures to determine the extent to which the, the, the healers are all agreeing with each other as well. Um, and that allowed for other kinds of uh, interpretations regarding um, each individual's knowledge and abilities as well as, in a sense, how prevalent a particular condition is. The ones that are most common are the ones in which there would be the easiest consensus. Uh, everybody knew what they were, kind of a thing. Okay, so, moving towards the end now. So there's a clear nosological structure of the catchy medical knowledge, okay? There is indeed uh, a medical system here, okay? And it's evidenced by these distinct epistemological or nosological, if you want to call them that, um, categories, okay? What we saw in other aspects of the research, which we're not documenting today, is that the healers would invoke that structure. In other words, they would draw from the latent empiricism of that structure when treating specific cases. So. So what? Okay. Well, what this work does is it counters any arguments that indigenous medical systems are necessarily unstructured, unsystematic, and unorganized, particularly those of um, what were sort of um, uh, uh, not uh, medical systems was not characterized by some of the major global alternative systems, uh, such as Ayurvedic and traditional Chinese medicine and this kind of stuff. Um, but the the medical systems of what uh, anthropologists in the past referred to as tribal peoples, okay, um, where there aren't they aren't the the medical schools like there is in traditional Chinese medicine and whatnot, right? That uh, the knowledge uh, is generated and passed on in in much less formalized ways, okay? Um, so there, it does counter this argument, okay? It demonstrates how cultural processes work to create a system of knowledge despite the lack of the deliberate effort to create such a system, okay? Which is to say that they don't try to create the system and pass it on. This is not necessary from their point of view. It's never dawned on them to do what we've done here today, to look for the structure of the system. Okay? It's implicit in their practice, but they've never made it explicit. They've never had to explain it, uh, and it's never been explained to them. Okay? Um, so this is a good example of how cultural processes are working to actually create a system, even though people aren't aware that such a system is being created. Okay? Uh, and it opens up the door for some of the collaborative potential. And you'll see here at the bottom some of the healers working with some of the hospital personnel and some meetings that we've held over the years, uh, working with members of the Belize medical system to explain this to them, uh, to open the door for a stronger collaboration between them, which is something that these, uh, these catchy practitioners really feel would be helpful. Um, every time they've tried to do it, they've been faced with the kind of stereotypes I've talked about. Hence this research to say, no, it is. It is empirical. It's systematic. Here's what it looks like. We can discuss to the medical doctors in terms that they will understand using their language. 
all right? Uh, and so it, it allows for this kind of collaborative potential. It is dispelling a lot of the myths that the, the medical practitioners have regarding what it is the, the catchy medical practitioners themselves are actually doing, okay? So my argument then is that catchy therapeutics are best thought of as a medical practice rather than healing. The healers seek to cure patients to restore them and the implication of this is that as the catchy medical system is being more recognized, it should not be marginalized to treating psychosocial or cultural issues. And this is typically what is what happens to indigenous therapeutics when biomedicine contacts them. Whenever there's talk about collaboration or making space for indigenous therapeutics, that space invariably is dealing with psychosocial issues trauma, for instance, post-traumatic stress disorder, this kind of thing, um, and, and sort of cultural issues, as we see much of the uh, uh, work that's being done today with uh, Indigenous peoples in Canada, right? Looking at issues of loss of culture, loss of language, and this kind of thing. That's where it tends to be marginalized, okay? Um, and the implications of this research is that it shouldn't be marginalized there, okay? But we, in order to not marginalize it, we have to acknowledge that it is also a medical system. In fact, in the catchy case, they're not really particularly good at the psychosocial or cultural issues. That's not what their system is about. And so when they are forced to do, it, to, to do that kind of thing, when we go to workshops and they're asked to show you know, what they know and what not, right? This is what is being expected, and this is not what they're going to do. Okay, so it, it, it kind of confounds a lot of people. Okay. So, the research matters to the catchy people in a lot of different ways. And over the 15 years, these ways have, have changed and evolved and whatnot. Um, the research itself is an act of resistance for the catchy. Um, it allows these practitioners to talk back to the assimilative forces, of, particularly of the churches, um, but also of the government and the, and the broader sort of immigration dynamics that's happening in which they are um, slowly losing their population dominance in the southern areas of the country. Um, and so resistance is a, is a, is a key um, value that they have uh, been able to take from this. Along that lines as well, it matters because uh, it, it, it part of a process of revitalization. Okay? Um, it's promoting the catchy language, um, the catchy worldview, catchy knowledge systems, as equal to that of the colonizers. The catchy don't say it's better. Okay? These practitioners aren't out to prove the colonizers wrong. They're simply trying to get a space alongside. Uh, and in order to do that, um, they feel that they need to demonstrate that it, what they know is uh, uh, equal value, equally legitimate, even if their way of knowing is different. Okay? Um, it's to convince their own kids that while learning science is really good, learning a catchy knowledge is also important. Okay? The healers, they talk about a kind of triangulation in which they say any issue can be understood both from a scientific point of view and a catchy point of view. Okay? Two different ways of going about it, but they ultimately come to the same answer. This is how they, they interpret the process, right? That these are different ways of getting to the same thing. Both equally valid ways of doing it. Okay? And of course, it prevents that marginalization, what uh, uh, Daniel Mormon referred to as song and dance. So it isn't just about the highly visible ceremonial aspects of much traditional indigenous healing. Okay? Um, it, it's about actual the delivery of clinical medicine in a clinical, clinical context. Okay. Um, this is particularly important for them because right now, after a decades-long process of policy making, um, in which the catchy practitioners were trying to be heard. The Belize government um, has included traditional medicine in its culture policy, its national culture policy. This is an important step for the catchy, but it's not included in the national health policy, and that is a problem for them. 
again, they don't want it to be marginalized as a cultural thing. They want it, mar they want it to be accepted as a medical thing. Okay? And so as long as it's in the cultural policy, it's protected because it's quaint cultural practices. All right? They're willing to accept that to a point because at least it gets them into the conversation, gets them in the room. Okay? But that's not what they were going for. That's not what we continue to go for. We continue to go for the idea that it should be included in the national health policy. And finally, why does it matter to scholarship? Well, to begin with, it counteracts the psychological and psychiatric bias in research on traditional medicine. That's what I started the talk uh, um, emphasizing. Um, it is, it is, uh, has such a strong hold on how scholars think about these things that we, we can't seem to get away from the idea of the psychosocial and the symbolic and these romanticized stereotypes about what indigenous therapeutics are all about. Um, and this case, the Ketchy case, and it's not the only one. There are other cases like the Ketchy that have been documented but are ignored. Um, is really talking back to that scholarship and saying, okay, let's not just look at the psychological and cultural dimensions. Let's look at the biological, the physiological dimensions. That's where their knowledge lies. Okay? That's where they are effective. Okay? It reminds us that indigenous knowledge systems are empirical systems and not just in symbolic systems. Okay, we've seen a lot of the attention on the, the importance of the oral tradition, which is good, um, but often that discussion of the oral tradition ignores the empirical tradition, which is, uh, is, which is also important. Okay? Uh, it reinforces the need to comprehend and work with ways of knowing from the participant's perspective. So this is a good example for you students of an inductive approach. Okay, um, um, and in, in a sense, an abductive approach, sort of that moving back and forth between induction and deduction, uh, in which the, the practitioners themselves are using their language and their concepts to try to explain what they're doing, and I, as the researcher, are them reframing that analytically to try and establish some kind of a structure. Okay, uh, and this is important because one of the key goals is translation. This is what the practitioners want the research to do. Okay? They don't need to talk to each other. They need to talk to the power brokers. Okay? They need to talk to the policy makers. Right? They understand that the power brokers and policy makers won't understand what they are saying. And they're not position to explain it. This, this has been 15 years of work, right? With them, right? To even get to this point, right? You can't just put them in a workshop and say, here, tell us what your medicine is and think that something meaningful is going to come out of that, right? Um, because the way they think about it is very different, right? So this is where research comes into play. They need the research to take what they know and translate it into a language that the policy makers, the biomedical people and whatnot will be able to understand. Okay, um, that idea of translation is often criticized. Uh, um, for me, I, it, not only is it what they want and what they felt that they need, but you can't do it properly until you nail down this point here. Okay, working within their way of knowing to understand it to the best of your ability, um, what they know, uh, and then figuring out how to translate it. Okay. When I've gone back and, and, and showed them the results and whatnot, you, they, they say, oh, yeah, well, it makes sense. I mean, you know, whatever. You know, it makes sense if, if you think that that works and that works. And they're pretty, pretty laissez-faire with respect to that. Um, again, because that's not how they think about it. And so it's kind of weird to them to think that well, you, would, you would put a structure onto this and you'd have categories and this kind of thing, right? Okay. Um, and finally, I'd say it highlights the global value of doubly engaged research, that in an era of engagement um, and engaged research, um, there is plenty of room for contributions to scholarship as we continue to work in partnership with indigenous communities to undertake research that is of value to them. Uh, it doesn't need to be either or, and in fact, um, each empowers the other, each makes the other more valuable to everybody. And when done properly, 
uh, I think that uh, it, is, it is really the way that, that uh, we as anthropologists have to do our work. So as the catchy would say, Banthi Osher, thank you. And this is, this is little Pamelita, uh, who is named after our own Dr. Pamela Down. <laughs> thank you very much. So I guess there's a few minutes for questions. Unless I nailed it all down perfectly. Mm -hmm. <laughs> ah, yeah, go ahead. You talked about knowing from participant perspective. Is that just basically feedback? That's kind of a survey type feedback from the patients? I'm not sure I'm following what you mean. Knowing the medicine from Participants' perspective. Yes. Consultations. No, the uh, practitioners. Okay. Most of my research is focused on the practitioners. The patients. We interview the patients uh, for the case studies. Okay. Um, by and large, the the the, pac the patients don't really understand much. Okay. Um, the the practitioners don't really explain much to them. Um, they may not explain what their sickness is. Uh, uh, the most explanation a patient is going to get is with respect to any um, um, uh, treatment that they have to undertake on their own after the, the practitioner has left. Usually that means um, how to combine the plants, prepare plant medicines to take for X number of days, three times a day or whatever, right? How to do it or how to bathe in the, the medicinal plants or something like that. Uh, and then the healer will come back and check up on them. So um, when you talk to the patients, I have another uh, manuscript that I've, I've forcing our grad students to read for a seminar tomorrow. And it, it's the, the main title is, I don't know the words he uses. And that's a quote from one of the catchy patients. No clue what's going on, right? So they're not good sources of information about what happens in the clinical encounter because they don't really know what the practitioners are doing. So we focus most of our energy on working with the practitioners precisely to determine the system as it is in place, okay? So, these methods could be a gold mine for oral medicine. Mm -hmm. that, that's, I hope so. That's your opinion. <laughs> <laughs> Oh gosh, yeah, that'll uh, that'll that'll happen sometime after my time on the planet. I I suspect. Did, did you yourself take some treatment? Did you benefit from? Oh yes, oh yeah, no, yeah, you get sick a lot in a place like this. I mean, especially, you know, with um, uh, food, water contamination issues, and a lot of nasty uh, bugs and whatnot. I'm bug prone, I think, and so I bleed a lot when I get bit by bugs and whatnot. And there's a lot of strange things that attack you and and, and whatnot. Um, so. Yeah, no, I, so I, you know, I, um, I never did go to any of the biomedical services when I was there. I, I would go into the hospital and meet with the doctors, and then it was pretty scary in the hospital, actually. Uh, and so I usually just tried to avoid having to go there. And so. Did you record all your, your own? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. yeah David. Thanks, Jim. That was really good. Um, did you get a sense, or did you determine the, the patients who go see the seers, do they also access biomedical? And if they do, like, what's their decision making? Well, I have grad students can answer that question, but uh, um, <laughs> yes, they do. Um, we're, we're in the process right now of really trying to understand the decision making process by patients who have access to a variety of different um, medical systems, including biomedicine and, and catchy medicine. There are other traditional medical systems in the area as well, right? So that's research that's being done right now and has recently been done by some of our uh, uh, MA anthropology uh, graduate students, right? So um, they do that. That's a common phenomenon. Um, and so that's exactly that we're just exactly trying to figure out why they decide to go here or there, at what point they decide to change directions, under, under what circumstances will they consult both, say, a biomedical practitioner and a traditional healer at more or less at the same time, right? So we're doing that right now. So there's no clear picture. Um, but one thing that does emerge is cost. And it, within the the Belizean medical system is free of charge to Belizeans. Um, the, the traditional practitioners are paid. They don't set a fee, but there's an expectation of payment to them. 
So depending on the proximity of the patient, sometimes they find going to the local clinic or the hospital is more cost effective than going to the traditional healer. In other cases, not so because there has to be some sort of bus transportation or somehow to get to the clinic. And that costs money, so then they go to the traditional healer instead. So financial issues are, seem to be one of the, the key things. Yeah? Uh, can it not be both medicine and healing? Of course it can. <laughs> Yes, of course, it can be both medicine and healing. In fact, um, uh, in, in other places where I've written about this, I, made, I do make that point that these are not mutually exclusive processes, um, that uh, it's quite common to have, have them interrelated in some way. Um, from a practitioner point of view, in this case, it's medicine. Okay. When we look at the patient's understanding of their medical conditions, um, they're often thinking in a much broader context, okay? So we, we're using the concept of well-being to try to understand how they uh, deal with disorder and the idea of, of being cured, right? And they're less interested in the disorder being gone than they are in, um, I, can, I can grind corn again. I can do the laundry again. Um, I'm out in the community again, okay? So they, their, their view is actually different from the traditional practitioners. But yes, they, typically they will be part and parcel of any treatment. Okay? But what I want to do is look at it from the point of view of these medical practitioners who don't care about the idea of healing at all. So, yeah. That doesn't mean healing can't happen, even if they don't care about it. Yeah? Among the airload handler, is that right? Um, is there any apprehension of, say, pharmaceutical companies stealing uh, plant knowledge and making the big bucks while they get zippy doo Well, thank you for that, Gabe. <laughs> nice, simple issue. Um, they, okay, so as part of their association, they have been working in the area of intellectual property rights. Um, they have a very pragmatic understanding of that. Um, they, do not un they do not see the medical resources, particularly plants, as their property. They see them as, as they have a common property attitude for the most part. The, um, and, and as I've tried to communicate here today, they see what they know as something that can be beneficial for all human beings. So they're not necessarily putting restrictions on that. They also understand that, I mean, you know, the Mopan people use the same plants. Like in, over in Guatemala, they're using the same plants. All throughout Central America, a lot of the plants are the same, right? So the, nobody owns these things in any meaningful way. So, um, you know, so they're, they're more concerned that when they're working with the botanists, which they do, that uh, it demonstrates that they know what they're doing, that these plants have the medicinal effects that the practitioners say they do, uh, and this is corroborated by the scientific inquiry. Uh, and so uh, that's, that's really their main issue. They, they're not really too concerned about squib making a lot of money off of this stuff. Uh, so, yeah. Sandy. Uh, given that Maya were a high civilization and they had writing, while they got, went through brutal suppression by the Spanish and their was a lot of cultural loss or hidden culture from the mainstream. Is it possible that once upon a time, Mayan medicine was sort of like a regional cultural medical system similar to the Ayurvedic in India or traditional Chinese in China? In that there was more organization, training, etc., etc. Uh, certainly, when you look at the archaeological evidence, there's, you know, you see uh, you see hierarchies because uh, it was a hierarchical society. Um, medical practitioners uh, were fairly were distinguishable by rank, so it was very clearly a profession, uh, and so it would it would then logically uh, uh, seem as though yeah, there was probably a fairly detailed. Um, guild-like knowledge associated with being a medical practitioner in some of the city-states that, that existed at the time. Um, the, the, the 
the contemporary people don't pay too much attention to the ideas of the going that far back. Um, they don't see any direct link to that knowledge from the pre-colonial periods. Other than that, uh, they just assume knowledge has moved forward through time, right? So if where you're going is that, is it possible that there was once a much more organized, codified medical knowledge that was then dismantled after colonialism, but the remnants stayed? Yes. I mean, it's possible. Uh, I, but I wouldn't, I wouldn't know. I wouldn't be able to answer that question in, uh, for sure. But you do see the, you know, you see in the, the traditional texts uh, that the Maya that are left from the, that era, uh, clear references to me medical guilds and that kind of thing. Um, I'm going to go over here. Um, are there no women healers? Oh, I get that question all the time. <laughs> It's a yes and no thing, okay? In the area of, of Belize where we work, okay, um, they're there and they hide because what they do is they, um, some time ago, uh, the Belize government co-opted many of the women healers into the midwifery training programs, okay? Uh, and so they were rather clearly told that you're not to be a traditional healer even though one of the reasons they were valued was because they had traditional healing knowledge. So now they, they are midwives uh, and nursing assistants and this kind of thing, and they don't hang the shingle. They don't allow themselves to be known as traditional healers. So they don't overtly associate with this particular group. We've had lots of meetings with them over the years to look at collaboration, and they always get very nervous that they might get in trouble with the government if, if it's found out that they do any traditional practices. Okay. That seems to be a unique thing here in Belize um, because over in Guatemala, there are lots of catchy women practitioners. All right? So there's no gendered reason women can do this as well. Uh, it's just for historical political reasons in this particular area, they aren't known to be doing it. Okay? Um, but that, one of that, the knowledge that these women have is one of the things we're going to be tapping into in the next project. So, yeah. Oh, yeah, Clint. Yeah, thanks, Jim. Uh, I know that the uh, Mayan societies are, are plural religiously, and, and I'm interested in whether the evangelical people actually do go to the healers uh, as well, uh, related to David's question there. But also, uh, picking up on what Sandy was saying, do you see any connection to what you might call uh, Mayan spirituality or, or, or ceremonialism or, or what have you? as part of the healing? Or, or is it definitely distinct as, as a different intellectual tradition? OK, uh, OK, uh, your second question. Oh, yeah, no. Uh, um, prayer, for instance, is an intimate part of what they do. OK, so when you saw those pictures of them holding the, the pulse, OK, what they're doing is they're, they're reading the pulse. They're either diagnosing or determining what the sickness is or uh, figuring out whether the treatment is working. And they'll be talking. And the whole time, what they're doing is, is, is glossed in the literature as, as a prayer. They're talking to God. Uh, they're exhorting God to make the patient better. Or they are talking to the sickness. Uh, they're not talking to the patient. Okay, um, but the, you know, what we think of as spirituality is an intimate part of what they do. So it, that's definitely there. I didn't focus really on that here. Um, part of the reason is that people go, it's like, here, look, here's the shiny ball, spirituality. Okay, and everybody goes over there, and then they miss the empirical part, the clinical part of what they're actually doing, right? That's why I wanted to emphasize this other part, right? But when you put it all together, then um, uh, you know, the spirituality is uh, a core component. Like a lot of indigenous healers, they will say that um, they're not actually doing the treatment. It's, it's, it's God that does the treatment through them and whatnot. And in terms of your first question, um, of course, Catholicism has been there a long time. Uh, and um, uh, Catholic symbolism is part and parcel of what they do. Uh, the healers will have altars with, with saints, little statues of saints and stuff like that. Um, they, they will make a sign at the end of a treatment and this stuff. Um, whether or not it has the same meaning, that's a good question. In general, it's different. So 
like a lot of um, colonial situations, they have taken on elements of Catholicism, um, but altered it to fit their worldview. Okay, uh, and so and then just the one other point is that some of the uh, the, the evangelicals go see the, uh, the the healers. That's such a good question because it's interesting that some do. It depends on who they are. Um, the U.S. evangelicals absolutely not and. and uh, when you encounter them, you know, they come in these big buses and vans and they run through villages and it's just, it's just horrible what they do. And um, I like to spook them, you know, because, you know, I'm, I'm working with the devil, right? Um, <laughs> and uh, they're easily spooked, actually. But um, what they, of course, they try to do in, in the villages is get uh, local catechists, local people involved, right? Uh, and those are catchy people. And so when the... U.S. evangelical people are not really looking. The catchy people will go around. You know, um, same with um, the, uh, local Catholic officials who are also catchy, right? So if they're catchy, the pull is very strong. It's still there in a lot of ways, but they do it secretly. And the the, the practitioners were constantly telling me about these people coming around at night. You know, not telling anyone, but going to see the. The, the practitioner, but then getting up the next day and, and condemning them for doing the work of Satan. <laughs> yeah. But those, like I said, those are the local people, right? It's not the, the big U.S. corporate evangelical machine that is moving in here right now, which is, they're, you know, they're, they're running all the radio stations. I mean, you, every 50 feet down the road, there's Jesus died for your sin sign and all kinds of stuff. Like, it's, you, you just can't escape it. It's in your face everywhere. I've never seen... You know, and they're all competing with each other as well, the different evangelical groups, right, to, to save the souls, right? So it's, um, it's yeah, it's, it's tough. And uh, the, the practitioners really wanted to talk back to those evangelicals in the work. So um, the documentary film we did is pretty hard-hitting about the evangelicals. So. of how many non-catchy patients, I mean, we don't count, and we, we haven't attempted to do that, but what we encounter um, mostly are uh, mestizos and griffina. Griffina are descendants of African slaves and Carib Indians. Uh, it's a major population in Belize, right? Both these groups have their own traditional medical systems, and so they are, in a sense, have an affinity to traditional approaches, right? Uh, but they won't understand the language at all. Right, and so the, the, these practitioners are most likely to treat them. Um, the uh, and the other group is the gringo backpackers, right? They, they they come through, you know, looking for the authentic uh, experience. And one of the things we talked about when we started doing this work because um, they they do insist on being visible and named and whatnot uh, uh, as part of their um, their knowledge system was that you know people will come looking for you the more known you become. And so we've had a lot of meetings about how to handle that, right? Because, and it does happen, the, you know, the gringo backpackers come through and they want to they find Mr. Francisco because they've heard about him and he's famous and all this kind of stuff, right? So they'll do that. Uh, and, I mean, the, 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 the practitioners don't care who you are as long as it's a serious inquiry. If, if you really have a problem, they'll help you out. Right, but if you're just you know spelunking and you're looking for the authentic tourist experience and whatnot, they won't treat you. Um, but they'll they'll gladly take you and show you medicinal plants and whatnot. I mean, you know, they don't really hide that sort of stuff, so they'll, they'll educate you. Uh, but treatment is only if you have a legitimate problem, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, thanks for a great um, talk. Um, my question is a bit related to Clinton's, but it's thinking more from the formal medical system. 
So are there many uh, Ketchi Mayans who've been through formal medical training, uh, training as doctors or as nurses, working in the formal health system, perhaps in the Ministry of Health or whatever? And how do they um, interact with the, with, with the cultural healing um, aspects and then the formal system. I'm just thinking of my own experience in Timor and the sort of wearing different hats in different situations. So when you're within the context of the, the clinic, the hospital, you sort of renege on, on the traditional healers. But when, once you're back home and you're with your community, of course, you also consult the traditional healers. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't encountered any catchy people that are medical professionals at that level. Uh, right now, you'll find them as uh, nurses, um, um, medical assistants of various kinds and whatnot. Um, you know, th it's an undeveloped educational system in the indigenous areas, and that's part of what they're fighting with. Um, there are um, other Maya medical professionals. There are three Maya groups in, in Belize, and uh, the y Yucatec in particular, the ones in the north, um, have an, uh, they're, they're more likely to be um, going to me uh, Mexican colleges in the med, uh, and so they get a better education there than they would in, in Belize, right? So um, there, are, there are a few of them. Um, there are, I've encountered some medical practitioners that are mestizos trained in places like Cuba and whatnot and have good training in traditional medicine or else just grew up with it in their families and their mothers or fathers and whatnot, right? Um, but very few of the catchy people themselves are attaining the, that level of education. But do you, do you get a sense within the formal health system that there is a sort of pressure not to um, recognize or not to um, uh, promote um, traditional medical practice? Absolutely. That's why it's entrenched in the cultural policy. Uh, they're very sensitive about the diverse cultures of their country, uh, and they understand that traditional medicine is a part of those cultures and they have been influenced by the intense lobbying of the various cultural groups. But like the healers very uh, uh, astutely pointed out, it's in the culture policy, not in the health policy, right? Which is back to the song and dance idea, and that's not what they want. So that's why we're continuing to do the work. So. Anyways, I think we've run out of time. I think it's 6 o'clock. Yeah. Um, I want to thank you all for coming and being so attentive. I, I hope that... Uh, that you'll be able to make some of the other uh, talks in our series and you can watch for the ads that will be coming out. So thank you all very much.